welcome back to the Universe Extended presented to you by Planning Phase Syndicate. This is our After Hours spoiler show, which, by the way, if you are new to Planning Phase Syndicate, this is definitely a spoilers intended show. So if you're watching this and you have not watched the most recent Ahsoka's, tune out because we're going to say some shit that you're going to be like, ah, oh, did I not know that? But with that being said, let me bring in my co-host for tonight. Please welcome the Lions fan himself, JJ Gridiron. How are you tonight, sir? And I love I'm calling you Gridiron because that probably is the worst. Like, it's just, it makes me feel like you're tough for the Lions. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, I'm doing very well, man. I've <laughs> definitely been enjoying this Ahsoka series so much, man. There's so much to unpack, and I can't wait to get started, man. So what we normally do, just so you all know, and again, spoiler alert, we talk about anything Star Wars related that, that we love. We missed last week. We decided we're going to do episodes six and seven uh, tonight, where we talk about what has happened in the last two episodes of Ahsoka. And, and and this is a big one because JJ and I do not agree on how Thrawn should be presented. And um I can say I've already been right once. Like JJ's wearing a lion's hat for a reason. So I mean the Lions are better than the Giants so far. I think they got a better record too. They're three and one. Giants are what? One and two currently. Yeah. I mean, poof. I I didn't I thought they might have been two and two, but no, I guess not. They can't find even get tomorrow. that. We'll find out tomorrow. They play they play later than the line, so yeah. That's true. You mean like a whole nother week later because no. they're lazy? I mean so I don't... the the week starts on a Thursday and ends on a Monday. So that's it. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. I don't that's that's just a bunch of bullshit <laughs> that he's spewing. Um <laughs> with that being said, <clears throat> if you have not watched the Ahsokas, again, this is going to be your last warning. This is our spoiler show for the Ahsoka TV show on Disney+. Plus. So, JJ, kick us off. Where are we? Where have we been? Why, why do we have to talk about Thrawn when this is an Ahsoka show? And do we ever get to see Ahsoka again? Or is she just going to become a side character that nobody knows about? No, we absolutely get to see Ahsoka again. And let's start off with episode number six. So where we last left off at the end of the previous episode, episode number five, we saw that Ahsoka came back uh, after her spiritual encounter with Anakin, uh, which helped her turn into Ahsoka the White. Um, she manages to connect with the Purgle and uses the Force to allow the Purgle to or to allow herself to enter the largest Purgle and journey into hyperspace into the other galaxy where Thrawn is located. And uh, this also leaves Hera and um, Hera to face the new Republic Security Council to answer for her actions for it. So uh, coming into the beginning of episode six, we see um, we see uh, kind of like an interaction between Ahsoka and Hu Young uh, talking about uh, what what to expect of what they're going to go over there. You know, they're going over there. Hu Young has very, very high doubts of that they're actually going to make it over to where the Empire is. Um, and Ahsoka is kind of lamenting that she didn't have enough time to prepare Sabine for making the hard decision, uh, which now, um, because she didn't do that, this is now placing the Empire in a very good place to retrieve Thrawn and bring him back to their galaxy. And we get this nice little bit where um, they mention the stories that Hugh, uh, Hugh Young used to uh, speak to the Jedi younglings, and they reference it as uh, History of the Galaxy Parts 1, 2, and 3. And Ahsoka kind of like nods and weeks and says part one being the best, uh, which <laughs> I found that absolutely great because, you know, obviously they're talking about prequels, original trilogy and sequel trilogy. And Ahsoka is part of the first part. And uh, just having her say that, that was a nice little nod. And I got to say the best part of it is when she says, how about you tell me a story again? And he starts off with a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And that just, I, I was so... Like, I was so freaking, like, glad that they did that part. But it also makes me wonder, is the entirety of Star Wars based on this one droid and his stories that he tells? 
Yeah, it's crazy, right? Like, after, after, I don't know, like, I personally did not think he was going to be a big thing in this Yeah, series. I thought he was just going to be a side character, and <laughs> that's it. But oh no, not only is he, like, the more ornery C-3PO, that's, like, what he feels like. Like, he is the I've lived forever C-3PO that has zero anxiety. Like, yeah. he goes, he go, he his biggest thing is he's, like, I'm going to tell you something. And then she's like, yeah, blah, 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 blah. But I have to tell you, and it's not like the C-3PO nagging. It's just the, um, you know, he's giving an example um, and he's predicting what he feels is going to happen. And um, he's a little rigid for me personally, but I mean, it's nice to see that character fleshed out. And I'll tell you, you know, what's weird in Star Wars destiny before it like ended in 2020, they made him like a character. Like he was like an actual, like, 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 um, character you could, you know, take as, a, as an upgrade. And it was like, I was like, why this guy's not really that prominent in Clone Wars, but they must've known something was coming because like, for Christ's sake, like he definitely should be a character now. Um, cause yeah. he's a huge support piece for it. Yeah. I feel like, you know, he has so many stories about the tales of the Jedi and stuff that they need, like his, he, he deserves his own animated series just so he can tell about the tales of the Jedi. Like that'd well, be, that'd be really great. Yeah. Think, and think about it this way. Like I don't know if you ever watched princess bride. Yeah. But like, you know how like the narrator is there telling. Yeah. That's what he feels like. And like when he said, you know, like when he says those things, it's just like, Whoa, he should just intro all Star Wars movies for the rest of time. <laughs> That's what he should just do. <laughs> because, yeah. like, everything should just be a retelling of this stupid droid that's lived, like, 2,000 years. And, and it almost makes you think he has to be Force-sensitive to be able to, like, survive this long. Like, for Christ's sake, like, this droid has been around for a, a while. Yeah, you know? he rivals Yoda in, in terms of his age, right? Yeah. And he's not in, as far as I know, I haven't finished all the High Republic books, but as of now, he's not in High Republic at all. So, and Yoda is. So that's that's kind of like, I'm wondering if he's going to show up in some High Republic stuff. I, I, again, do not spoil it for me if you know, just because I haven't gotten through all the books, I'm on Convergence right now. Um, but as of right now, he's not in that book. Take, take us forward, JJ. What, what, what happens... That was a funny little clip, but what's the real yeah. episode about? So finally, uh, we shift over to uh, to Peridia, and we finally see the uh, the hyperspace ring uh, with um, with Sabine and Balin and Shin Hati uh, make it down, and they encounter the Night Sisters that are waiting for them. And I got to say, the planet uh, Peridia looks absolutely fantastic in terms of design. It looked like an evil Jetta right because you have these statues of the night sisters the great mothers that came before them um like plastered all over the planet there and it looks just like the statues that they had in jetta that we got to see in rogue one the ones that were fallen um and you know photos of, of similar statues that they had in in like legends and other uh star wars media for like some of the older planets you know before the whole galactic civil war and stuff and uh just a great setting um they they present, you know, they come over there and they're asking for where Thrawn is and they said, patience, he'll be there shortly. And then the Night Sisters uh, basically sneer at Sabine and they say that she reeks of Jedi. And Sabine has like a reaction. She's like, is she talking about me? Like <laughs> she has this, like, yeah. we know it's face. not her. Like we know yeah. it's not her. Like, what are you talking about, ladies? Like you guys really got this one wrong. Yeah. So um so then they use these these orbital these little orbs um that help constrain her and bring her over to uh to her imprisonment uh, her imprisonment where she's supposed to wait for what or whatever they're gonna decide for her fate. And she, uh Sabine hilariously tries to uh concentrate in her cell and try to use the force and for a split second the door starts shaking and for a second you're like, oh snap, she finally developed it. Nope, and it turns out it's just the shadow of the chimera coming in to hover above these the fortress of the of the night sisters and man did that that scene is probably the scene so far in all of this series is grand Thrawn's entrance to the show 
we see a very battered chimera uh, the chimera definitely had a lot of battle damage from uh being wrapped up by all those pergol uh you still see the chimera symbol on the underneath the isd and as you're approaching in you see this massive army of uh of, of troopers that are lined up and they're all chanting thrawn 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 Thrawn, and he's walking down the path, and as you're going through it, you get to see more details of these uh, these stormtroopers, and you can see the years have taken their toll on these armors. <clears throat> like the, practically all these stormtroopers have armors that have been broken and remended, and it has all these red strips on it, which shows that uh, obviously the Night Sisters have had their hand in repairing this armor uh, by giving them materials to mend their armor. And then we see the captain of the of the guard. Uh, his name is Enoch, and he has this awesome uh, gold plated face on his helmet. And he's the one commanding these troopers when Thrawn makes his entrance, who's played by Lars Mikkelsen. And my goodness, did he deliver for Thrawn as uh, acting as in Thrawn? I, I think the casting for Thrawn was spot on. He was absolutely perfect. Would you say that he was the blue data? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to wear that in there for Alex. That's for, that's for the Alex that will never listen to the show. But <laughs> I had to work that in there. Um, so I I agree for the most part that he is spot on. And some of it is is because like his voice is the voice of Thrawn and Rebels, right? So like we've heard this before. So it kind of translates and it makes it easier. But if you watch how he moves, yes, he moves very Thrawn like, right? Like the way to describe it in the books, he's obviously read the books or read something, a synopsis or something that explains to him how he should be acting because Thrawn has a particular movement set that they did very well in Rebels. And if you read the books, they describe how Thrawn thinks and like how you can put together how Thrawn moves and all these other things very well. And so far, and we'll just say episode six so far, he 100% captures that piece of it, hands down. Now, I will tell you the weird little Roman like stormtrooper guy. Don't get that, but um, I don't like that guy's face, and it, it's creepy, and it makes me upset, um, <laughs> personally. But um, like in terms of how Thrawn interacts so far, he is very close to what we've seen a in the books and b as well in the um, Rebels, uh, you know, animated series. I keep wanting yeah. to call it a comic book, and I know it's not that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And and we get the sense, you know, we get a little bit of the history. Thrawn interacts with Balin and Shin, um, who are introduced to Thrawn for the first time. Um, and the part that I just love, uh, just a little bit of details, is that as soon as Balin introduces himself, you know, Thrawn being Thrawn, automatically knows exactly who he is. He identifies him as General Balin from the Jedi Order, uh, and he... He obviously was well acquainted with his tactics, which is really interesting, right? Because we know that from at least what we know from the books, right? When Thorn came in uh, for uh, it was Thorn Alliances, I believe it was the book where he came in and met with Lu or with with, with uh, Anakin Skywalker. You know that was his real interaction with this section of the galaxy during that time, and just from that little bit of time and his exposure to, I guess, records from the Empire, he knew or was very familiar already with Balin and his um, his repertoire on who he was and how he operates. Um, and then he basically honors the agreement with Sabine, allowing her to leave the place um, to go and find Ezra. And he provides her with a method to leave the place and the last information for where they last knew where Ezra was. And then uh, connivingly uh, sends Balin and Shin to uh, go chase after uh, Sabine uh, to make sure that they eliminate Ezra and Sabine when she does end up finding him. And um, we get that a little bit of that interaction uh, with, uh, with Balin showing that he's not interested in the type of power that Thrawn brings, but he's rather more interested in finding what he calls the beginning and he find, he knows that there's a power on the planet that's calling out to him and he's trying to find that particular power now when he makes the statement what do you think he's referencing to is it a particular being that he's trying to find or is it like a place that has enormous power that he can harness um 
So I'm going to give you a weird theory that is not, I don't think, very supported. But to me, I think he's looking for that place of power and that it has something to do with the connection with either the Purgirl and the hyperspace jumping. Or it has to do with silencing the Force, which brings us back to the High Republic books, which are a big thing that we, we just don't have TV shows about, about them. But we do have lots of books about them. And in those books, the Nihil are like the premium, you know, enemy, basically. Like they have the Drengale, but really it's the, the Nihil. And they have this creature that is that eats Force people. That's what it does. It doesn't eat you. But it takes you and sucks all the force out of you. And the way I see Balin is, 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 is as a person that does not genuinely believe there is a balance inside of the force, that he believes that it is probably like wild magic to some extent, even though wild magic is what, you know, the, the, the sisters are performing. But like, I don't feel he likes the force aspect. And I think what he wants to do is level that playing field for whatever reason. I don't know why it seems a little very unfleshed out to me, but it feels like he feels there's this palace of power that if he either goes and inherits, he can eliminate it or he can disrupt the balance of the force. Now, my second theory is that he knows about Palpatine and he wants to go back and either time travel to stop all of this, or he wants to disrupt the force to stop Palpatine from being able to have unlimited power you know yeah sorry i shouldn't have done the voice but um <laughs> that, that's so, those are my options yeah yeah, yeah and, and i agree with it. i think that's that's something that they're they're kind of flirting with you know using or reintroducing the actual world between worlds to to allow for something like that to happen now my so i i'm i'm a little that and i'm for it because you know this is really a chance to like essentially wipe away all the bad stuff about star wars and you know start fresh with a whole new cast of characters by changing key events that basically um reshapes everything that we know about star wars and start from the beginning and you can still have a lot of the key characters in there like thrawn obi-wan and stuff um but just changing the events around it um but at the same time I would like to see it to the extent of Marvel where, you know, you have separate universes, right? You have this separate universe where Balin has affected the that particular world and see how that develops out and then still keep the original timeline, uh, which is what we know now with all the movies and the, the, the series and stuff like that. So that way that can continue. And like that, that just opens the door for a lot more free writing and it doesn't contain Star Wars and making sure that they have to go through the holy timeline, if you want to you know, say it like that. Um, and it, it just opens up a lot more design space for the story to go forward that way. So that that that's the kind of piece that I would like for that to see. So... Uh, so going back, uh, so we get uh, we follow Sabine as she travels through um, Peridia to uh, locate um, Ezra, and I gotta say the animal that they gave her to actually go out and like explore, uh, you could tell it was heavily heavily influenced by Dave Filoni's early work uh, when he was a, a a story writer for Avatar: The Last Ender, Airbender, the animated series. There's an animal that looks exactly like that, which is used by a bounty hunter that is hired to track Aang, um, that is known as a wolf bat, and that that design for that animal that Sabine is riding on um, is <laughs> very heavily from that animal. Um, so I, I thought that was a nice little piece of, of Dave Filoni that he added into the series, just making it part of Star Wars. And at first I was like, wait a minute, did they just jump into the Avatar's galaxy? And this is where we're at right now. <laughs> but um, um, so she encounters uh, the natives there, uh, which do end up attacking her. And um, I got to say, you know, you obviously taken a few shots and your bullets are bouncing off of her best car armor. <laughs> Why do you keep on shooting at her? Why do yeah. you just either aim for the head or try to take out her legs or something, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. <What>? exactly. <laughs> so um, we have a really good sequence there with uh, what's it being fighting off these marauders that are attacking her and stuff. And we get to see. Uh, a slight change in Sabine at this point where she's becoming a lot more comfortable with using the lightsaber versus actually using blasters. And she, she 
pre she she basically switches from using her blasters because they weren't effective in this fight and goes straight into the lightsabers. And one of the first moves that she does, uh, which it, it's a it's a blink and you miss moment, is she manages to actually deflect the shot with the lightsaber right into the opposing Marauder's face. That was one of the first kills she does. And I think she just did it reflexively. I wonder if she's actually starting to develop the Force. Um, it, it would be interesting to see if she actually does end up developing some sort of connection on it. But as of right now, she still does not have the the development in the Force as of yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's You, you just don't like how it's manifested. In yeah, I um, mean, hey, man, you know, <laughs> so finally, uh, she finds these uh, turtle people um, that she's uh, they recognize the rebel symbol on them. And obviously, uh, it was something that was given to them by Ezra. They lead us to Ezra. And we see a all grown up Ezra. Uh, he is he's got to be in his lad. 20s. It's Aladdin. It's straight <laughs> it's up Aladdin. Aladdin. That's exactly what I said, man. Aladdin <laughs> with blue eyes. And he um, he comes in and says, finally, you found me. And it's just a great moment to see uh, Sabine and Ezra reunited again. And, um, and you know, they, they basically leave off at that point for them. We go back to Thrawn, who gets summoned by uh, the Night Sisters, letting him know that they felt the disturbance. They feel that a Jedi is approaching the planet. And... Uh, Thrawn makes a comment, says, I wonder if it's the uh, recently deceased the Sokotano. Um, and he makes a mention about how the the Night Sisters and the Jedi uh, use uh, death and resurrections as different forms of deception. And uh, it asks the Night Sisters to um, use their dark magic once again to help out Thrawn. Yeah. And then we get the end of the episode. So, so hold, hold, hold on, hold that thought yeah. real quick. Northern Gamer said they aimed for her head a couple of times, but they she blocked it with the greaves. That's a good point. I forgot about that. You are correct. I think they got sick. Um, you got they got they got sick of shooting at her head because she just was that good uh, defense wise. I forgot about that. Um, yeah, it's been a couple. Of weeks. All right, sorry. Go on. Yeah. So. Um... So the implication here is that obviously Thrawn has asked the Night Sisters to use their dark magic already to, um, for other reasons, right? And this is where I feel that this is where the connection for, like, what's what's going to make, uh, what's driving Thrawn at this point, or at least affected Thrawn through all this time, is just obviously his 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 army has needed supplies. Um, they've needed help to. Um, to maintain themselves, you know, we see that, you know, when that that opening shot sequence when they're introducing the night troopers that they all have, you know, the seams of the the night sisters uh, materials, you know, the red cloth to help hold their armor together. And obviously that mask that Enoch has there and even the language that he speaks when he's giving out orders is not basic. Um, you can see the the heavy influence that the night sisters have had on his army so far. Um, I, originally when I saw this scene and, you know, he makes a comment about sending, deploying two, uh, two squadrons to go, uh, take out or assist and take it out. Ezra and Sabine, um, they, you know, he, they say, why didn't you send more? And he says, you know, we've suffered casualties along the way to two battalions or two troops should be enough. At first I was thinking, man, did Thrawn just like use these night sisters to keep his army alive, like reanimate them and keep them in, in, in their armor? Like, Holy crap, man, like that, that would be extra, extra dark, man. And that would explain like the fanaticism for these night troopers that believe that they can serve Thrawn and not have to fear death because he's going to bring him back using my sister magic. Like, what, what do you think? Um, I kind of agree a little bit. I, I do think that there is a possible night sister magic to keep them alive. Like it feels like, I mean, and it would explain the food shortage issue that we have, like, I don't understand where they're foraging shit from, right? Like, like I get it. It's probably there, but like, that's a lot of work and that's a lot of thing. I mean, and like, the bigger thing is why is this, that's, why is this stupid, you know, why is the ship still floating? Where is the power coming from? For Christ's sake? <laughs> but maybe they're using yeah, exactly. their power to hold it up too. I, I don't know. You know? Um, so I agree with you. I think, I think they might be reanimating some of these storm troopers a little bit. And I also, here's where, and this is where I, I feel a little bit better, excuse me, about how Thrawn interacts, right? 
if this is all this larger setup, because Thrawn's actually not the enemy, and he's actually figuring out how to transport stuff back um, to help the Resistance fight Palpatine and all these other things, if he's truly doing that, him sending the two and then playing it off, nobody understands Thrawn's brilliance here. These Night Sisters, like the, the, the Lady, um, Balin, none of these people actually know Thrawn at all. I mean, and let's be honest, if Ezra's out there, Thrawn is literally not invested a lot of time in going after Ezra, or he's that big of a failure. And like, we know Thrawn's not that big of a failure based on everything we've seen. Thrawn can be outmaneuvered. Thrawn can be outsmarted. But a lot of what Thrawn did in Rebels that he allowed these wins was to learn from his enemies, right? And to help set up, you know, for that final battle. I will say Thrawn was very surprised with Ezra. And I think that's the, the piece of the force that, that messes, right, with, with, with Thrawn. Like, they don't have that in the Chiss Ascendancy. They don't have any strong force users that do nothing but, like, focus their talents. They use their force users to travel the world. That's what they use them for, which is a shame. And Thrawn's, Thrawn's community should be very upset by that because, look, for Christ's sake, there's, you know, people. You could use, you could train them to be Jedi, right? Anyway, um, so I feel it's almost like Thrawn is like, yeah, I could spare these two because they'll get resurrected and really whatever. Like, I just need to learn about what's going on. And I don't actually have an interest in, like, doing what you want me to do. I have an interest in getting the fuck out of here for whatever reason. And that's what, like, Thrawn's distracting. He's, like, throwing this curve over to basically say, hey, don't worry. Don't worry. We'll take care of it. Ah, oh, no, we're going to fail. Ah, hoops. You know, that that's how I feel. Yeah, I think for me, it's more of a tactical reason, right? Because obviously the Night Sisters are sensitive to, to Jedi's being in their area, right? Because they can sense their presence there. Um, you know, Thrawn does make a quip about the the Jedi being very good at hiding at the later episode and stuff like that. But honestly, I think that Thrawn left Ezra alone in order to draw Sabine and um, and possibly Ahsoka or anybody who would come over to come and help them. And this will in eventually enable him to escape Peridia and leave them stranded, right? Because uh, when we get to the next episode, you can see that his main priority is to take whatever that cargo is that he's loading onto the Star Destroyer, onto the Star Destroyer, and get the hell out of Peridia because that's what he wants to do. He's not worried about his enemies that are over there. He's not going to over-pursue and overextend his forces. And I think that in order for him to decidedly take out Ezra with his level of expertise, I mean, because... I mean, for Ezra to survive on, on his own for that long on a planet that has marauders and also has all these stormtroopers and the military might, you know, it, it obviously it's going to take a considerable amount of, of of resources for Thrawn to go and take out Ezra. Um, and he's more focused on his other objective is to have a, a army of loyal troopers that can help him execute his plan for what he has for the larger plan for for when he returns to the galaxy so um i think it's more of a tactical plan for him to do that that and also to probably have the numbers to probably subdue the night sisters in the event that they try to pull some crap on him <laughs> uh, having an army of uh of loyal uh troopers to help you out against night sisters is probably a good idea too <laughs> probably you know <laughs> so moving on to episode number seven uh, we return back to um, to Ahsoka, uh, who, who is training on her ship and going through the forms uh, by the, according to the video that Anakin Skywalker left her, uh, talking about the different um, forms that she has to practice through, and he name drops. Uh, he's like, you're going to fight more than predictable uh, battle droids. You're going to fight. You're going to encounter Grievous. You're going to encounter Count Dooku uh, on the battlefields and Asajj Ventress. And I thought that was a great touch there. Uh, just really loving Hayden Christensen in this, like giving him all the different looks on how he looked throughout the Clone Wars in this series has been absolutely great. And it's kind of nice to see Ahsoka returning to her roots, returning to her training, and really focusing and allowing her to to come back retrain get stronger than what she was before and um and like get back to her old like top form and how she was there um and then you know we um 
we see them come out of hyperspace and they start getting uh, feeling like a bunch of explosions. And when what we notice is that we find that the Purgle have come out of hyperspace in front of Peridia, and there's this massive, massive minefield um, outside of the planet where all the Purgles are flying right through and it's triggering all these mines to come in and uh, start exploding around the Purgle around it. And I thought that was such a great piece of it. I really want Seeker Mines in X-Wing. I would love to see that. Uh, can no, you imagine? Stop it. No, no. Can yes. you imagine a mine that like hunts you down like a missile? Well, we have, we kind of have those with like, I mean, it's not a mine, but we have probe droids, <clears throat> right? A. And yeah. we also have super commandos, which, I mean, they're people like, I, I guess. Yeah. Imagine like homing buzz droids, right? You launch mm. them at, at, uh, or you drop them behind you, and then if an enemy ship at range one comes in, they start making maneuvers towards them automatically. Like that would be great. Like they active, it's like a, a proton bomb that's following you and explodes, and then it just ex they just does like a crit on you automatically when it reaches like range zero of you. That would no, be no, no, so great, bro. Nope, no, no, no. no. <laughs> Think, dude, that would be awful. Think about it. You get in range one, any maneuver touches that ship. Every maneuver does. So like. Yeah, double repositioning ships are the only thing that can get out of these things. No, no, no way. Like you, you, I, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. there has to be some, it has to be more like a bomblet generator where you roll and there's a variance. Like, no, 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 no. I do. No, I do not want them. I do not want them for the empire. Only CIS. If you're going to give them, that's it. Nobody else can have them. Maybe scum, scum and CIS are the only two that can have them. No one else. And even then I think they're, it's trash and you should be banned from creating X-Wing things. So, <laughs> no. So we see, um, we see Ahsoka's Jedi starship escape out the mouth of the Purgle and uh, trying to avoid all these mines, essentially using the Purgle as cover. And then all of a sudden, uh, Hu Yang is like, well, at least the Purgle are giving us some cover. And then immediately they jump into hyperspace right after that. And Ahsoka's like, you had to say something. You really had to open your damn mouth and say something. Like it was great. And okay, so here's here's my my this is my first nitpick here for this, right? We we seen in episode three, uh, the whole chase scene where the snub fighters are are going after uh, the Jedi uh, starfighter, so the ship, and they're actively getting shots at it, and they they're literally doing circles around the ship, right? Because the the bigger ship can't fly as fast as those spiders and yet this sucker is freaking out running mines how i don't know like I, I that's was, why I, the mines don't make any sense like it would have been better if it just was a minefield because i want to know where have these mines been this whole war well they it, they've had mentioned these mines in in other books and stuff um it's just this is the first time we're actually seeing it in a live action but they have had mentioned the seeker mines specifically um, in other in other books. So yes. All right, they should just be banned. We we don't need them. Banned. Just, <laughs> you know. So yeah, anyway, what's going to happen is AMG is going to release them. They're going to do the stupid maneuvers, and then the people that play test are going to be like, "No, will you stop doing this? We didn't like super commandos. We sure as hell do not want freaking mines, and they're not bombed. You know that, right? Like." Mines yeah, are bombs. different than bombs. So, like, yeah. bombs, you get the chance. Mines are, like, you know, I guess, except Automatic. for cluster mines. Like, <laughs> cluster mines. <laughs> yeah. Like, seven <laughs> points in here, you got to roll for them. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Any, so anyway, we, we're you're derailing us. <laughs> so, we have uh, the Jedi Starfighter uh, escape out of the, the minefield by going into the graveyard where they have the bones of all the purple. And then... Thrawn sends out these uh, the, the fighters again to go and uh, track them down and then ends up pulling them back uh, to to wait. And this is where he requests for the Night Sisters to uh, to locate them using their abilities. Um, during this time, we have uh, we go into the planet into Peridia and we see uh, Soka and Ezra uh, going through uh, basically traveling on these on the ships that the the locals uh, were using to move around. And Ezra explains that they never stay in the same place for too long; they're constantly on the move. So they're more like a nomadic tribe that Ezra has helped, um, I guess, help them out to like constantly move around and keep them safe. And we get the 
like the the abridged version of of Sabine um, updating Ezra on what's happened so far in the past nine years of what's happened in the in the galaxy, and we get this one line where this says, "So Palpatine died, right?" And she's like, "Yeah, that's what they say," and I'm like, "Oh man, I like that's that's perfect, right?" Because it's like, you know, somehow Palpatine died. <laughs> that's what it felt like, and. Um, and then we we see that Shin and Balin had uh, had located them and then sent out these marauders to uh, go set up an attack on them uh, to to hunt them down. And as that's going in, we go back to uh, Ahsoka and Hu Yang are hiding in the in the graveyard, and Ahsoka decides to try to reach out to Sabine in the Force in order for her to locate her on Peredia, uh to find her location. And Which we I, didn't know she had that ability, right? Like, that's new. Yeah, I think I think that's something. I don't think we've actually seen anything like, like that in live action. I think, though, it, the only thing that might for come her. close... For her, yeah, for Ahsoka, yeah. The only time I've seen that something similar would be the end of Empire Strikes Back with Luke when he's hanging for his life at the end, you know, at the bottom of Cloud City, and he reaches out to Leia, and Leia feels the call. I think this is the same ability, I want to say. Um, and then later on, Luke with uh, with Vader at the end of Empire as well. Yeah, um, I, I don't think this is a new ability. I'm just I'm just saying is we've not seen Ahsoka have it. That's all. Yeah, yeah, we haven't seen Ahsoka do that. Yeah, um, and then and this is the interesting part, right? Because when she does that, then all of a sudden we cut over to the Night Sisters that um, that tell Thrawn we've located her and we find her, and they provide the coordinates over to Thrawn for where their ship is hiding, and then Thrawn orders a barrage of laser fire to fire into their location, forcing them out of hiding. And it's really interesting, right, that the Night Sisters have the ability to essentially track other Force users uh, with their ability to the point to even be able to precisely pinpoint their location um, to to organize a military strike. That's something I don't think we've ever seen before. No, I don't think so. Yeah. So, um, so the the bombardment starts, and this forces Sabine to go into the ground, and um, and Thrawn sort of redeploys the squadrons to go down and uh, and go chase them down, and Thrawn is is actually happy for these turn of events because it's forcing uh, Soka to go and focus on uh, getting in contact with you know with Ezra and Sabine on the surface and not take a look at what they're trying to do, which is escape from the planet with their cargo that they have in tow and which we I, still I, don't know what that is yeah we, we have no we don't know it yeah it's so far from what we've seen it's just a bunch of crates and it's a large amount of crates enough to fill up the entire hangar bay for the chimera uh just based on the diagram that they put on there um so finally you know we go back to the surface we see um we see the the whole chase scene between the Marauders and Ezra, and the the Marauders manage to bring down one of those uh, one of those cards, and they form like a circle formation. And Ezra tells them to lock up and go full defense mode while Sabine and Ezra start handling the Marauders. And we get this great interaction between Sabine and Ezra. And the whole time I'm like yelling, "Why doesn't Sabine just give him back the lightsaber so he can start deflecting bolts back?" And finally, she's like, here, take the lightsaber. He's like, no, I'm giving it to you. She's like, no, take it. He's like, no, it's yours. Don't worry. The Force is my ally. And he gets this smirk. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he starts doing kung fu moves using the Force. And it was actually freaking awesome to see Ezra use the mastery of the Force in his limbs and using the Force to inflict damage and push um, enemies out of his way. It looked very, very much, it reminded me very much of the original Clone Wars cartoon with Mace Windu uh, in that one episode where he loses his lightsaber in the middle of a droid battle and then he just uses the Force to like destroy like this army of battle droids. That's what it very much reminded me of. What do you think? Yeah, I, ag I agree with you. It was weird. Like, it was very weird, but it was very like Obi-like, right? You know, like that's kind of what it felt like is, is he somehow channeled another you know like a pacifist and i don't hate it i guess and um i don't love it um i'm more happy that as we progress through the fight scene we didn't see it happen with um shin as much yeah because that was a concern i had um yeah. 
but that I don't have a problem with with the pacifist Jedi piece of it, I guess. Like, I mean, like, we've seen it in the books. It exists. It's it's a different track that people have, but it is a reality, right? You know? Um, so I'm not, I don't know, I'm not upset about it. And it was kind of cool seeing weird flying, yeah, pe- like, stormtroopers and, like, crazy shit like that, like, all over the place. Like, like I mean, like, it, it shows you the power that Ezra has himself right it's there yeah. yeah he's definitely grown so much in the nine years that he's been god you know for the fact that he's mastered the force to this extent i mean he he's got to be one of the best force users so far that that we've seen like just pure skill for the force um I, and i would wonder if we'll eventually get a scene where he encounters kanan a live action kanan jarrus that will officially make him a jedi knight like that would be a really great scene to see for for ezra right for him to gain that rank um but anyway so we see the encounter between ezra and shin hati and he uses the force to uh essentially stop her blade before it reaches him and it, it, one of the best details on it is that if you take a look at shin's blade when he stops it the portions that he has his hands on on the uh like like stopping the saber you can see the edge of the lightsaber bend out <laughs> away from ezra yeah. from the use of the force and that's such a great detail that they added onto it i absolutely love it and then um and then uh ahsoka arrives on scene she comes out uh jumps off from the fighter while it's being pursued by these snug fighters and she lands and encounters Balin's skull and right before this whole scene uh, Balin basically parts Ray's with Shin and gives her a piece of advice telling her that um, that if you try to rush towards your victory, you're almost always going to run into your defeat, you know? And this this rang very true. So Balin ends up encountering Ahsoka, and we have a completely different match. Like, Balin is still strong, and he is... The way he fights with the lightsabers, and if you hear the... The sound effects that they use during the, the lightsaber battle, there are moments where he locks blades with Ahsoka and then he uses the force to push her down and away uh, using the force while he's locked in there. And it's really interesting to see his mastery of the force being able to use the force while wielding a lightsaber and able to force push it, force push his opponents down um and basically overpower them that way um it was a, a great piece of choreography that they used uh, for this this particular battle yeah and a lot of people have kind of said well why is she able to overcome him now and it's because you learn things right you know like and i also don't think his heart was in it i genuinely yeah. think that he felt duty to distract her enough to provide cover for shin but he kind of just told Shin, hey, you, you make your bed, you lying. You know, like, <laughs> you're making a poor decision here. I don't know how to tell you this. Um, and, and then it begs the question of, does she know what his alternative goal is? Or has he kept that to his chest? You know? Um, yeah, I think he's kept it to the chest. Yes, Shin doesn't understand what Balin is really after, right? Because she's she's constantly made mentions about joining teams with Thrawn uh, so that way they can obtain power that way. And he constantly is telling her, no, that's not what he's seeking, that that kind of power is not the, the way that he's seeking for something else, something better. And even as he mentions about talking about how he misses the Jedi Order, but he doesn't miss the weakness of it, um, and that he trains Shin to be something better than a Jedi, um, it, it just speaks to the his perception of the standard that he wants to set right for himself and his Padawan. And she's willing to let her go because he can see that she has ambition for more tangible power than what he's searching for. And she, she's not going to follow in that path. Um, and, uh, and towards the end of the duel, we see... Um, Balin and and Ahsoka fight it out, and then finally we see the uh, the Jedi starfighter come by, and then carpet bombs the area while Ahsoka yeah. force pushes him into the bombs. Yeah. So now we know that the Jedi starfighter has a has a, a bomb slot, right? Yeah. <laughs> yep. A little weird. Um. Yeah, I don't I don't understand it. I didn't I didn't get that part of it. I didn't I didn't get. I guess. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then um, Ahsoka steals his wolf bat and goes on to go find Sabine and Ezra uh, and turn the battle on that. And then we get the scene where uh, we go back to Thrawn. He's taking a look at the battle and he's he makes a mention. It's like, wow, this battle's turning out just like the Jedi of old. And he just, he, he, you could tell his admiration for it. Um, but it's well within his expectations of what's going to happen because he's like, you know, where's General Valen Skull? What is he doing? And when he figures out that he's basically not assisting with, you know, the the defeats of these characters, he's already put into his calculations on there. Now, the best part is when uh, he gets the information on Ahsoka, on who she is, where she came from, who her master is. And he reads and it says General Skywalker, that realization on his face when he knows exactly who Anakin is or who he was as Vader, it was just great because he immediately has a stern reaction to it. And he's like, well, we better prepare to get out of here because if she's just like her master, he's she's going to be very unpredictable and very dangerous. And that key line right there is just great. Just that's, that acknowledgement, that respect for his opponent um, after knowing who that opponent is, is what makes Thrawn great, I think. Well, I mean, and it, it harken, that harkens 100% back to the books more than the show because that harkens yeah. back to the, the, the books where Thrawn and Anakin were together and then when Thrawn and Vader were together. And they yeah. there's a part where they're he's together with both versions. And Thrawn's not dumb. He's able to put two and two together as it is. So... Yeah, definitely. And then, um, and then finally, you know, they're, they're asking, uh, he's like, you know, I, um, the, the Night Sisters and Morgan Elspeth is like, you know, wouldn't you consider this, this operation a failure because they weren't able to take out his enemies? And he says, no, he's like, our primary objective is to load up the Chimera and get out of here. And when we're gone, it'll strand our enemies here. So it doesn't matter what they're doing here, as long as we're out of it. And that is the key difference in Star Wars so far, between every single bad guy that we've seen here so and far, the, the the bad guys are all about, I got to kill my enemy, and that's the only way I'm going to win. Thrawn is like, nope, I'm going to delay my enemy because I have a really true objective, what I need to complete, and that's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to keep a level head about it, and I'm going to complete my objective. And I, honestly, that's the key piece, what makes a good villain, because he's willing to make small sacrifices to lose small battles in order to win the war. And that's, that's the best part of Thrawn so far. Well, and that actually harkens closer to the book than we see in Rebels. In Rebels, we see him get very upset when failure is happening compared to in the books. In the books, he's not rattled very often, just a little bit, <clears throat> but not very often. So. Yeah, definitely. So finally, um, the, the battle ends with the Empire retreating, leaving Shin by herself to face off against Ahsoka, um, Sabine, and Ezra. And uh, Ahsoka tells her to lay down her weapon and that she can help Shin. And Shin uh, runs away from the, from the area. And uh, the, Sabine is about to give chase. And Ahsoka just tells her, hey, let her go. It's fine. And we finally get that reunion between ahsoka and ezra you know they haven't seen each other since uh the end of season four rebels in the world between worlds that was the last time they see each other and you gotta imagine it's got to be a shock from for ahsoka especially right seeing ezra as a kid and now he's a grown man in the time that you know she hasn't seen him and it's 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 got to be a hell of a shock to see each other um you know, in that, in that space. And it was just, it ends on a really nice note for, for those characters. Yeah. Yep. And I think, I think if you think about it, it's, it's a nice reunion. And again, I've, I've stated this before rebels. Rebels is a great like detour. It's a great piece to star Wars, but the Thrawn books are just, the cat's meow and we're seeing more of the books minus my discomfort for how they're going to portray Thrawn, but we're seeing more of the book style Thrawn than we did in rebels. And, and I guess Greg, you make a good point that the empire puts a lot of pressure on Thrawn. Therefore Thrawn acts different and can freak out more. I could see that. Um, 
but that and you know, uh, governor, in, in just to reference one particular freak out, right? This was Thrawn's tight defender project, right? That he was currently fighting with Krennic to obtain funds, and uh, Governor Price basically blew up the entire fuel depot to kill one Jedi and then tried to hide it by throwing a massive parade. Uh, yeah, I would be pretty pissed too. <laughs> You just tanked my research and development that I've been fighting tooth and nail against the Death Star project. Uh, yeah, great job. Fair enough. All right, so, anything? So anything let, else? let's let's do our quick, you know, conversation. Um, yeah, for there's Thrawn. not going to okay. be a quick conversation. It'll be a quick conversation. Okay, so you know, my my You're take wrong. is boom. Thanks, everyone. My take is <laughs> that Thrawn is definitely the villain here. Or sorry, I, I let me let me rephrase that. He is going to be the antagonist for this series. Is he necessarily a villain? We'll see. But he is definitely portrayed to be the antagonist. He's going to be the big baddie for this series, but it doesn't necessarily make him a villain. And I think that's what they're doing so far. And you know, there was an interview that I sent you where they were interviewing Timothy Zahn and his opinion on how so far they've handled Thrawn. And he said that, you know, Dave Filoni is doing exactly, you know, he's he's very proud of the work that Dave Filoni has done so far with the live action Thrawn and, you know, keeping in spirit with who Thrawn is. And if he's got Timothy Thrawn's approval, I, I say that Dave Filoni is doing a great job in portraying him as the antagonist for the series, so, even if he isn't as dark and villainous as, let's say, Palpatine or Tarkin, for instance. No. So two things. One, in that interview, Timothy's on clearly states he wants to write more shit for Disney. He will 100% yes. side with Dave Filoni no matter what because he wants to get paid, JJ. It's not about it it's not about him wanting to progress Thrawn all the time, right? Now, I didn't like that interview very well. I think that it was very shrouded in bullshit. It was cut yes, it was. apart. I'm not, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, it that, was. Yeah. Th th that was cut <laughs> apart to create a narrative that was not there from that interview. And they cut the interview short because they were out of time. And it's like, I don't know. That guy seems like he ain't got shit to do. Like, I'm pretty sure he's gonna hang out with you as long as you want. <laughs> like, I don't know what you're talking about here, folks. You know, like, like give me. Give me Timothy Zahn and I'll spend two and a half hours with the guy, you know. Um, but the the issue, so, so whether he's a protagonist or not is inconsequential. The, the idea here is that if you read the books, the problem I have is the Rebels Thrawn does not fit with the books Thrawn. The Rebels Thrawn is way too aggressive and angry and wanting to murder things and too much Empire-ish. If you read the books, it explains... Spoiler alert, again, at the very end of the last series, they, they talk about Thrawn failing his mission and taking the blame for all these things in an effort to get expelled from the Chiss community onto an unknown planet, and he's secretly working with Arlani, which I would love to see, and uh, the, the yeah, senator guy. Huh? Yeah. Uh, 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 General... General... Bail or whatever. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. I don't remember. I have to go back and reread those books, but he's working with them. Um, you know, Eli Vanto and another person, and they're working to essentially because they feel the greater thrisk or risk to the Chiss ascendancy is not just the Grisks, it is a bigger threat than them, and it is something they send him there to get caught by the Empire on purpose. They do this on, this is all predictable and done on purpose. It's a, it's a setup. And so, <laughs> um, either which way. So my problem is, is if they feel, fall into the old era of the empire, which is what they could be doing. And they go back to the original villainous Thrawn, where he was genuinely part of the empire. It ruins all of those books because in the books they portray Yes, somebody who is um, what we would call amoral. There you go. Like, that's the nicest way to say it. He's pretty amoral in his decisions and how he aligns himself. But he does everything for a greater purpose. And his ultimate purpose is to protect the Chiss Ascendancy, not to pay, satiate Palpatine, not to align with Palpatine, not to be the next power. It is to understand the new threat to the Chiss 
And that is what Palpatine is. If we understand the guy that can replicate himself a million times over, it seems, and magically somehow come back and convince a guy to murder a bunch of kids for two times. He's done this twice now. <laughs> People yes. have just murdered kids <laughs> twice for this guy. Um, so yeah. Thrawn sees yeah. this as a larger issue. And if you go back to the books, the one thing about the Grisk, there was, I can't remember his name, just Jixtus. Yeah, Jixtus is this mysterious character 